today's episode, we're going to be looking at the original Honda CBR900RR Fireblade SC28. I mean, just take a look at this thing. Oh yeah! If you've stumbled upon this video, there's a good chance you already know the Fireblade backstory. Ultimately, it came down to an adamant engineer and designer at Honda by the name of Tadeo Baba, who wanted an agile, lightweight motorcycle that also packed a punch with a powerful engine. The result is the Honda CBR900RR. I'm not looking to wax any more poetic on the history of this bike, because it's pretty well known and there's plenty of other videos and articles that go over this. It's almost redundant. What we're going to be focusing on this video is what it's like to own one, what you got to look out for if you're actually wanting to buy one, and what it takes to keep one up. That means both mechanically and cosmetically. So let's dive in. The CBR900RR is made for nearly a decade. However, it's the first generation, the 92, 93, and 94s, that are the most sought after. You know you're looking at one if it has the iconic round headlights. While the Fireblade was introduced in 1992 to a lot of the world, in the United States, we didn't get it until 1993. It was introduced in this brilliant red, white, and blue paint scheme for the North American market. This particular bike has only 991 miles on it. It is pretty much stock condition. The only changes that have been made to it are these aftermarket bar ends and the aftermarket seat covers. But otherwise, we have a museum quality example to do this review on. We can really take it back and see what these bikes were like the day they were launched. Now to begin, the frame on these bikes is an aluminum perimeter frame, which really is a mark of a modern sport bike. It has beautiful welds throughout, and the subframe is also aluminum, and it's bolted directly to the mainframe. This gives you an indication that it's designed to be replaced should you accidentally wheelie the bike a little bit too much. The bodywork is made of ABS plastic and is of high quality throughout, however it is fairly complex compared to modern day fairings. Even the tail unit is a multi-piece unit. The plastic becomes very fragile over time and you'll often see cracking throughout wherever the interlocking tabs are present and whenever there's through bolts that hold them into place such as down here. The signature features of these first generation CBRs, of course, are the round headlights, but also we have these speed holes in the fairings at the very top of the cowl, and then also on the sides of the cowl near the bottom. If we peer behind the front wheel, we'll see that there isn't a ton of protection from rock chips. We do have a belly pan centerpiece right here, and then you'll see that there's a stone guard on the radiator protecting against large stones, but small pieces of sand and all that can still certainly get through. Everything is painted in the white under here, and these pieces are fairly complex like on most sport bikes where you have interlocking tabs and pop rivets that hold everything in place. The gas tank is made of steel, and you want to watch out for any sort of rusting that might be happening either on the inside from fuel sitting in the tank too long, or even on the outside down near the seam welds at the bottom. The gas tanks often fall victim to the pinch weld becoming rusty because it gets scratched up when it gets moved around and the carburetors need to be worked on. And that's usually because these isolator bushings fall off and they don't get replaced and the gas tank starts hitting the frame and rubbing. So that's not good. Be sure to watch out for these bushings whether or not they're still there or not. It can often point towards neglect or just general disrepair. The gas tank also holds about 4.8 gallons of fuel is pretty standard for the class. The switch gear and gauges are pretty standard for 80s and 90s tackle. So we have analog gauges that show speedometer readout. This one goes up to 185 miles an hour. And we can see on the tachometer that we redline just at 11,000 RPM. We also have a temperature gauge and then some idiot lights down here such as oil, your turn signal, neutral light, a high beam light, and also a side stand down light. Something to watch out for on these bikes are the switch gear themselves. They can get kind of gummed up, making the turn signals not snap back to center. This is pretty easily remedied by disassembling this mechanism and then re-greasing the contacts in there. The top triple clamp right here is a nicely machine finish item. However, it suffers from scuffing from key rings right up here as well as just general weathering. And often looks pretty rough even on bikes with just over 10,000 miles. This one is in decent condition because again 
The mileage is under 1,000 miles still. Standard bar end weights are pretty hefty units. These are aftermarket, but they still pack a lot of weight to them. Helps with some of the vibrations that you might feel through the handlebars. The original windscreen, of course, is a clear unit, but it does scratch really easily. So be careful with any sort of towels that you're cleaning dust off with because you can easily scratch this and it'll be hard to get those scratches out. The brake system on this bike is pretty advanced for the time. They're four piston front calipers made it to 17.7 inch front discs. The front rotors are also floating rotors, which allow for a little bit of lateral movement and expanding and contracting as they go through heat cycles. The rear brake is a single piston sliding caliper on a fixed rotor which offers plenty of power for the rear end. The front master cylinder is a standard fare for the era. It's not a radial master cylinder but it still offers adequate amount of stopping power when it comes to the front brakes. Due to the age of these bikes, it's always recommended to rebuild the calipers on the bike and clean out all of the old brake fluid buildup that might be present in there and also install new brake piston seals so that everything is fresh going forward. Be sure to check out the linked video in the top right corner on how to rebuild fire blade brake calipers. For the suspension, your front forks are right way up forks, but they have machined fork legs to make them kind of look like they are the upside down style. You do lose a little bit of rigidity in the system because of that, but for street riding, guess what? You don't really notice it at all. The forks only offer preload adjustment and rebound adjustment and no compression adjustment. That came after the 1994 model year. The rear suspension is controlled by a mono shock that offers preload compression and rebound tuning ability. However, the rear shock is overwhelmed in standard spec and because of the age and mileage that most of these bikes have now, there's not a whole lot of damping left in these original shocks and it's time to replace them with something from the aftermarket. The swing arm is an aluminum piece with a braced section on the top to give it that extra bit of rigidity. A point worth noting about the swing arm is the fact that it doesn't have any place for a spool to be mounted so that a swing arm stand can easily be adapted. As you can see, the swing arm stand that I have been using here uses a rubber cush mount to go underneath the swing arm. Contributing to the bike's ethos of good handling is a 16 inch diameter front wheel, which is an inch smaller than most sport bikes. This small front wheel gave this bike a reputation for creating tank slappers. Many owners who put this bike on the racetrack will upgrade to a 17 inch wheel to give it a bit more stability. Going to a larger front wheel also gives you more tire choices. The rear also contributes to the flickability of this bike as it's a 180 millimeter section rear tire instead of the common 190 millimeter tire for a bike with this engine capacity. And now we get to the heart of this machine, which is an inline four cylinder engine that has 893 cc's, it's a dual overhead cam, and it's fed through four Kihan CV carburetors. This thing puts out 124 horsepower at 10,500 RPM and 65 foot pounds at 8,500 RPM. That's pretty good numbers for today and for back in 93, that was very impressive. Now since this is a carbureted machine, that means the fueling system is fairly agricultural. The fuel goes directly from the fuel tank into an inline fuel filter, then it goes to a low pressure fuel pump that feeds the carburetor bowls. If the bike is even remotely cold, you'll have to use the manual choke here on the triple tree to start it up. The transmission is a six speed with a wet multi-plate clutch. There's no slipper clutch here, so you definitely have to be careful on your downshifts. The whole system is cable operated for ease of maintenance and simplicity. Routine maintenance is fairly easy on these bikes as far as the oil and filter change it needs to be done about every 3,000 miles or once a year if it comes to that. The valve adjustment intervals is every 16,000 miles and if you'd like to see how to actually adjust the valves on these engines, go ahead and look in the top right corner of this video for a how to exactly on that system. It is a shim under bucket style valve train so it is a bit more complex than other motorcycles. It's a good idea to service the coolant system every two years and flush it with new coolant. You can fill up the coolant through this little cap here on the right side, recess in the frame, and you can check the fluid level right behind the rear shock. Brake fluid should be changed about every two years. With the bikes of this age and mileage, you'll often find that those reservoirs are fairly hazy. You can still buy new reservoirs for these bikes, brand new from Honda and get them looking up to scuff once again. The rear brake fluid reservoir can be seen between the frame and the rear fairing. 
The electrical systems on these bikes are fairly robust aside from the voltage regulator which is known to go out. If that goes out the battery will not charge and the bike ultimately will die on you or just straight up will not run. A replacement regulator runs about $100 and it can be found underneath the rear fairing. Because this engine is a carbureted engine, it does require a bit more maintenance when it comes to the fuel system. If the bike's been sitting for anything more than a couple months, it's very possible that the carburetors have become gummed up and need to be cleaned out. Expect to spend about $25 per carburetor for a rebuild kit. Fit and finish for this bike is really good for the era it came from. However, now that these things are getting on in years, you'll notice that some bolts will start to wear their finish and start to rust. The exhaust systems are known to rot out, especially in the midsection because it is a mild steel pipe. And the stock muffler itself often scratches very easily because it's just a thin layer of black paint on it. Other areas to note, again previously mentioned, the fairings have a high propensity to crack just because of age, they become brittle. And the tail section is a multi-piece unit that has two sides and then a center piece in the middle that tends to crack very easily if it's ever disassembled. The brushed aluminum heel guards often get a polished look because your shoes rub up against there. It's just not much you can do about that. One thing to note is that the original turn signal stocks can develop sag like this. This can be fixed by purchasing new turn signal stocks that are available aftermarket. Another area to watch out for is the timing chain tensioner. It's an automatic tensioner right here on the right side of the engine. They are known to start losing their tensioning abilities. The spring becomes slack and then all of a sudden your timing chain starts slapping around. A common aftermarket upfitting is to put a manual timing chain tensioner in there with just a screw adjuster that you can set and forget it. Checking the oil level on the bike is very old school. You have a dipstick here that you unscrew from the right side of the engine and otherwise it's very much like checking the oil on a car. You want to make sure that the bike is completely vertical, standing straight up. You do not want to check it while it's on its kickstand. The actual level is checked without threading the dipstick into the casing. You just pull it out without threading it in and you check the level there. As with any vehicle that gets up there in age, the OEM part sources start to dwindle. And that is definitely true for these fire blades. If you need any sort of cosmetic parts, that means fairings or gas tanks or even lighting fixtures like the headlights, taillights, or turn signals, well, you're out of luck. They're just no longer made. You cannot get them new anymore. You're basically left to whatever's available on the used market or possibly on the aftermarket. If there's one part that certainly cannot be obtained anymore. It's a part that was probably the first thing that got cut off on these bikes when they were new and that is the rear fender. Occasionally these will come up for sale used but very rarely. The only saving grace on the fenders is that they are cross compatible between all the CBR 900 RR years. So everything from 92 all the way up to the latest model will fit. So it doesn't even really need to be said, but you're better off buying a bike that's in better cosmetic condition than mechanical condition. Mechanical parts can still be purchased for the most part. All right, so now that's all the technical stuff about these bikes out of the way, let's go see what it's like to ride one. No, we're not going to be taking this one as it only has 991 miles on it and I don't want to put it over a thousand. No, we're going to be riding that one. That's right, I've got another early CBR 900 RR. This one's a 94 and it comes in a pretty awesome looking black, purple, and yellow paint scheme. This thing just screams early 90s. Now this one has many more miles than the white one we were just looking at. It has 41,000 miles and I have to say it runs just as well as a brand new bike. This bike's just a testament to how Honda's build quality made sure that these things lasted forever. Now this one has a couple more aftermarket upgrades to it. It has a Two Brothers period correct exhaust system on it, but it still has the original rear fender. Be sure to check out the video in the top right corner to see what it takes to replace a rear fender if you like this original look. I purchased this bike simply because I wanted one that I didn't have to feel bad about putting miles on. So let's do just that and take this thing out for a spin. As with any carbureted bike, you gotta give it a little bit of inspiration to get it going off idle, but it springs to life easy enough. This thing's got that Meteor Two Brothers exhaust system on it compared to the stock exhaust. It sounds pretty good. lot more 
smoothness compared to your fuel injected stuff, especially today with the throttle by wire. When you have a direct connection to the throttle bodies, it's just, I feel like you have more control. These 4K and CV carburetors offer quite a bit of control. They're, they fuel really well. The whole power band is really smooth. There's no point in the power band where it just wants to rip the handlebars out of your hands. I mean, it's a great, smooth power band. It's really a comfortable machine overall. The bars are somewhat high for a sport bike, and they're not stretched really far out, making it uncomfortable. The foot pegs are, I mean, they're average for a sport bike. My knees don't hurt after an hour of riding, which is always good. As with most sport bikes of this time period, you get this kind of awkward looking upper fairing support. It doesn't really interfere with your view of the clocks or anything like that. I mean, it's something you don't see on today's bikes at all, but it was very common for back in the day. There's no fuel gauge on this bike. You'll have to watch your trip odometer and reset it every time you fill up, but you can easily get 150 miles from a tank of fuel. This bike gets, on average, you know, 35 to 40 miles per gallon. It all comes down to how you ride it, though. I'm sure you can get well over 40 miles per gallon if you just kind of take it easy on the throttle. One thing that I didn't mention that you should watch out for when going to buy one of these CBRs is the brake light switch, especially on the front brake. They tend to go out fairly frequently. They're cheap to replace. The switch is usually about 10 bucks or something, even from the Honda dealer. This bike is fitted with the standard rubber brake hoses, and the whole brake system is plenty adequate for the street. Um, I'm sure if you were to get this thing on the track, you'd be wishing for a bit more bite out of the front brakes especially. And I'm sure using the stock hardware, if you just upfitted some better pads and maybe some steel braided lines, you'd probably get a bit more bite out of this. But again, for the street, it's plenty adequate. The suspension on this bike is very catered to the street. It, but as with any bike that's old and has a lot of miles, such as this one, everything eventually just needs to be rebuilt. Or get the sand. What the hell is this? What the I have no idea what that's all about. I don't even know how they did that. But they were... Oh my god. I bet the dog told them to do it. Did you see that? shocks for these bikes from Olin's and from uh, Nitron. They all make something for the bike. But they are a considerable financial investment. Um, be prepared to spend about $1,200, $1,300 to get the rear end riding correctly. The proportions of this bike are excellent, but it's also very wide. It just makes you feel like you're riding something substantial. If you look at modern bikes, they're very slim, and you know, that's great for uh, on track performance, but in the real world, is it really a good thing? I don't think so. It means you have less road presence, less surface area for people to see you as you're riding down the street, and also you push less air out of the way. It means more air is directed directly to you. The bike is not taking care of it. So, when it comes to street ridden motorcycles, I much prefer a bigger, beefier body bike like this one. I love it when you pull up behind a pickup truck and you can see the front end of this bike. I mean, that iconic dual round headlight just looks so awesome. I mean, you know one of these bikes is coming when you see that. I really think that's where 
the next generation of the 900RR kind of went downhill. It's just, it lost that awesome looking front end that just tells you what it is. It became a bit more generic looking. brother's pipe is really really loud maybe a little bit too loud for my own liking but those original exhausts are impossible to find and I'd have to rejet the carburetors so I just leave it be heavier than Honda's own 600cc at the time. I mean, dry weight is 408 pounds and wet weight is 452 pounds. I mean, even today, that's not too bad. Well, look, we got the, the later evolution of the 900RR, the 954 over there across the street. That's a great bike too. Wouldn't mind having one of those sometime. see those 954s anymore either. You definitely don't see 900 RRs anymore. There's nothing that resembles the original look. Most things are pretty hacked up. Make it bearing bikes and stunt bikes and really not much 900 RR left of it. It's too bad because these are such great bikes in stock form. They're so good that people just started modifying them thinking they'd make them better, and maybe they did make them better for stunting, but as far as a good road-going motorcycle that can do some sporting intention type things, standard is best in a lot of ways. So this engine has 41,000 miles, and I really do think these engines get better with age. As they begin to break in, they just get even smoother. I mean, when you're at around town speeds, you know, under 7,000 RPM, it's just such a smooth four-cylinder. When you start taking it up higher, all the way up to that 11,000 RPM red line, you start to get some vibes going throughout the bike, especially in the handlebars, which is why it is fitted with such heavy bar end weights. It's not unbearable, because again, you're not spending most of your riding at those upper RPMs. And where you are most of the time, it's just buttery smooth. note. No mistake in this little big bike. to say about this bike. I mean, it just works so well. It's 
there's nothing really to complain about. I mean, it's an older bike, so it doesn't have all the fancy electronics that something more modern would have. The carburation is really, really great. I mean, there's no fluffiness in it. It's very responsive. It leaves you really wanting nothing.